So Oliver was, I mean all Nanas say this, but Oliver was a good grandson. He was. <laughs> he was very loving. Oliver Schoen was 11 years old. He was Marie's only grandchild. Oh, he loved the um, computer, Minecraft and Lego. He built amazing Lego cities and things like that. In January, during the final days of the summer break, they went on holiday to Gisborne together and visited the beach. We went down to the water's edge. It wasn't over my ankles. And just as we walked along a bit, there was a log, one log just lying there. There was no water around it. Although the waves were coming in back again, but he just jumped on it and stood there for a bit. And then he laughed and jumped off. And then he got on it again. And that was it. I don't know what happened because I can't see it. I just remember all these people rushing past me and grabbing him. Then I carried him up the beach. Did I just see him lying there on the sand? Cyclone Hale had hit the region two weeks earlier. The storm swept logs and debris off the hills, down the river, and out to the sea. It's not your fault what happened that day. You were being the perfect grandmother, taking your grandson to play on the beach. Every other grandmother in New Zealand would have done the same thing. My grandmother. I was a grandmother. If somebody had shot him, they'd be in prison. If a car had knocked him over, they'd be in prison. But a log is OK, according to them. And I think also the big picture, the forestry people. I heard that there's forestry standards. Well, I don't think they're implementing them because how can you let all those logs that you see on the news, how can you let those roll down a hill and destroy people's houses and homes and livelihood and everything? How can you let them roll down rivers and end up on beaches? Somebody needs to be responsible for that. If I'm going over the hill, I can't even follow a forestry truck at the moment. I have to pull over so I can't see those logs. So you can't even see a, a forestry I truck? I hate those trucks. Because that log could have easily been on one of those trucks. It should have been on one of those trucks. Do you feel different when you see pine trees growing? I don't like pine trees. You don't like pine trees now? No. No more Christmas trees. <laughs> have, you, have you heard from anybody in the forestry industry, any company, anybody about what happened to Oliver? No, nothing. Nothing? Nothing, no. Do you feel, Marie, that you and your family have been ignored since Oliver was killed by the log? Yes. I think they're just hoping we'll just sit still and do nothing. But when I heard about that little girl, I thought, I couldn't live with myself if I didn't do something to stop it happening again. I don't know how they sleep at night, those people. That other little girl is Juliana Marston. She was visiting Gisborne in the April school holidays, playing at the beach with her cousins. Are you going to do some writing? Yeah, you are. Hi, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> so me and my cousins were on a log, and then a wave hit, and I fell off, and I was on it while I was rolling. 
the log was yeah. rolling. Yeah. And, and then, then it stuck. Then it turned my leg under it. Your leg got pinned under it. Yeah. Juliana's brother, uncle, and dad frantically dug her out from underneath the log before another wave came. This log was massive. There was no way we were going to move it. Um, bottom half, particularly her right leg, was in a really unusual position. And we were a bit frightened about what we were going to find when we dug her out. Clint rushed his daughter to hospital. Her pelvis was fractured. Well, we're very lucky. We've got Juliana sitting here with us um, with an injury she's recovering from well. Um, it could have gone a lot differently. What do you want everybody to know? I just want justice for Oliver. He didn't die for nothing. He was only 11. He had his whole life ahead of him. They want them to sort out their slash. This is the beach where Oliver was fatally injured and Juliana's pelvis was broken just a little bit further down. It is the central beach here in Gisborne. We're hearing from multiple people now that there is no way that they would let their children or grandchildren play here anymore. So we're heading upstream to try and find out where these logs are coming from and if there's any way they can be stopped. So your job, Murray, is that you come down here for the council and try and figure out where all of this wood on the beach has come from, right? That's correct. Um, it's pretty obvious that this is a pine log and then we try to track it upstream. Murray Cave is the principal scientist at the Gisborne District Council. He was instrumental in the seven successful prosecutions brought against forestry companies after Slash first reared its ugly head here five years ago. Those companies said they would change, they'd do better, but have they? OK, so this is a, a fresh-cut log. What's the significance of it being a fresh-cut log? This tells us that we're still getting logs being lost from a harvest site and coming down on the beach. Yeah. We're still seeing this. It means, it, means that they haven't changed. Um, well, it certainly means that some of the contractors there are not following good practice. Do you know what type of log injured and, and killed Oliver? Um, for Oliver, we do know that it was a fresh-cut log. It was a fresh-cut log. Yeah. Yeah, I've, so, been, I've been down photographing logs on the beach, assessing them that morning before, before the fatality, and then went back. There's a log like this. Um, so this kind of size? Yeah. Well, it was longer, um, and it wasn't didn't have quite the diameter to it that this one did. But it just, I mean, it, just, it doesn't seem that big. It's a lot more danger in them than you think, just yep. by looking at them. Yeah. Yeah. And for, for a kid, they just think of them as being a toy almost, something you oh. play with on the beach. Yeah. You've done all that work on all those prosecutions yep. to try and stop this from happening and then that tragedy unfolds. Yeah, it shouldn't be happening. Right. You're right. <laughs> Just take a minute. Yeah. Um, just up to our side here we've got the port itself and um, just visible on the other side there all the log yard. Uh, and the beach is just around the corner. And the beach is just around the corner. So, Murray, where do the logs on the beach come from? What we did immediately after the Cyclone Gabriel, we flew new aerial photography over the entire region and we've actually mapped all the woody debris down the river and we can trace it all the way from the top of the catchment, from all the forestry areas, down to the, um, the river mouth here and then onto the beach. So you've studied this for a long time and you know that the logs are from the Waimata catchment? That's correct. At the top of the catchment, it's 95% pine, but as it's coming downstream, we have essentially like a bulldozer of logs coming down, and they're just knocking over trees on the river margins. All that material making its way down the river has a huge impact on the community. Just upstream from the Waimata River mouth, it's forcing Flory Brookings champion Waka Ama Club off the water. Oh, it's a huge issue and it's been an ongoing issue and it really hinders our ability to train on our river. With the tides coming up and down you can't see 
um, that woody debris, mm -hmm. um, it can do some damage to your waka and consequently, you know, damage it and the kids can flip out. Yeah, has that happened? Yes. It's a lot to contend with for a championship club. There's huge impacts around the slash that's going on in this community and enough is enough. The issue of slash has become a lightning rod for Tairawhiti Gisborne, so much so that tonight we're headed to a community meeting where people from right across the region are coming together to try and figure out what to do about it. On top of the agenda is the ministerial inquiry into slash and whether anything will come of it. Hats off, it's compelling, it's concise, it's broad in scope. Some were positive, but many here believe the report lacks crucial details on how to solve the slash problem. What does this mean if, if I'm currently a forestry contractor? What does it mean if I'm currently a farmer and most of my land is steep? The report, to me at the moment, it's, it's all words on paper, and the proof for me will be in the pudding. And underlying it all, a sense of hopelessness and despair. You can't fix it now, it's too late. In 1988, Cyclone Bowler struck New Zealand and it hit Gisborne and Tairawhiti the hardest. There were massive landslides, largely due to the clearing of native forests back in the early 1900s. Now, the government wanted to prevent this from happening in Tairawhiti again and came up with the East Coast Forestry Project back in 1992. Now, it gave out grants to plant fast-growing radiata pine, which was thought to have incredible root strength to stabilise the steep, erosion-prone land. Cut to 2008, and the government introduced the emissions trading scheme. Pine trees make carbon credits, which can be sold to offset carbon emissions. Basically, you get paid to plant pines. So, it was a double whammy two big government schemes incentivising the planting of pine trees. And plant pine trees they did everywhere. They now cover 1.5 million hectares across the country. If it was all in one place, it would look like this. But that double whammy of pine planting near Gizzi was a ticking time bomb. We now know that when harvested, there can be weakened roots, serious erosion, and damage to the soil structure. The big problem started in 2018, when storms hit Gisborne, coinciding with the harvesting of the pines planted after Cyclone Bowler. The now weakened soil gave way, and what came down was something called slash. And we all know what that is now. This was in 2018, remember. The Gisborne District Council pursued seven prosecutions against forestry companies for not managing their slash properly. They were successful. Things should have got better. They didn't. We all know they got a hell of a lot worse. And Oliver Schoen was killed. Yeah, you can just see that river is full of sediment and just lined with forestry debris, trees all along the side of it. Oh, it would just be so sad if that was your river. Look at it, it's such a mess. And so how many years have you been farming here for? We came here from Tolliga Bay in 1956. Mervating's sheep and cattle farm near the top of the Waimata River is forever changed by the lost logs, sediment and slash brought downstream by multiple storms now. This last lot after Cyclone Gabrielle is by far the worst he's seen, leaving his river flat unrecognisable. Gosh, it's a right old mess down here. And this was pasture, beautiful pasture yeah, along here. it was. It was all like over there. So we've lost that and the river's changed course and it's over there now. Four hours, five hours and all this came down and over behind this here, there's another big heap. What happens next with all of this? Who's going to clean it up? Well, we've had a few discussions over that. They can't take it anywhere. They can't bury it. So they're going to burn it. It's, it's quite to, shocking to look out there yeah. and see all of this. I just thought before this last rain how good the place looked. We had everything oh. done, all the fences were good. And then this happens. Well, you just sort of got to live with it after a while. <laughs> we, we've had four floods, I think, four or four, five. So do you, do you actually feel that, that you just have to learn to live with this amount of 
debris and slash coming down the river. You get used to it after a while. I mean, <laughs> it's just part of the part of your routine. But we've never had anything like this before. Mm. This bad. The problem with these enormous slash piles on Merv's farm is that they are, of course, on a floodplain. The locals believe that the next big storm or cyclone is just going to wash all of this down the river, through Gisborne and out onto the beaches. But there's something lurking further upstream that they are even more concerned about. So the woody debris just came down the Waimata River like a freight train and took everything with it. So, like a freight train, so it's sort of like a bulldozer, just yeah. pushing just ripping its way everything down. out of there's a wind. What so is you can it? sort of oh, see yeah. it. Oh, right, yeah. Okay, so this is all slips that have come down. Yeah. Laura Watson's family have farmed in this region for 99 years. She also leads up the Waimata catchment group. She takes us to its headwaters and shows us something few have seen. Now, we knew there were landslides, but it is the sheer scale of them. They are everywhere. And it's why Cyclone Gabrielle sent more pine trees down the river than ever before. These trees are between 10 and 15 years old, so should be in prime earth holding abilities. And so what you can see here is after Cyclone Hale, Cyclone Gabrielle, the hill slopes with the trees on it and everything else have just collapsed. Completely given away. Yes. And so all of those trees, with every rain, they wash down further and further. Mm -hmm. So what you're seeing on Waikanae Beach today, this is kind of what's coming. They are supposed to be holding together this yep. highly erodible land. Yeah. And they're collapsing. Yeah. It's a lot to get your head around. I know. I know it's a lot to get your head around. Mm -hmm. But this is new, you know? Like, mm -hmm. this is the first time we're seeing this sort of damage done on a large scale. Yeah. In this forest alone, it's up to 50% of it. Up to 50% of the forest? Of the, of the has... area of the forest wow. that's collapsed that's... after Cyclone Gabriel. Wow. And that's horrific. How do you feel about that? Sick. Our catchment's just one mm. of many across mm. the East Coast where this is happening. You know, someone has been saying for a long time Somebody is going to die. And now that that's happened, it's just like, something needs to change. What were your first thoughts, Laura, when you heard about little Oliver showing? Like, sorry. Sorry. It's OK, just take a minute. The damage to our land is, you know, it's pales in comparison to that. And just to know that potentially that could have been prevented through proper forest management and just it should never have happened to a child playing on a beach. I'm at Tolaga Bay Beach, up the coast from where Oliver Shone was killed. And as you can see, there's a clean-up going on. I'm here to meet with the forestry industry to see if there's any kind of justice for Oliver and his family. Clean up like what we're seeing now, which is great. Oliver Shone's grandmother wants to see something like this to make Waikanae Beach safe I agree now. With, I agree with her, and that's something that I'll be advocating for. Philip Hope is from the Eastland Wood Council. It represents several forestry companies in the Gisborne area. As well as telling him what Marie wants, I show him. How can you let all those logs that you see on the news, how can you let those roll down a hill? They're very confronting and, and um, you know, I think everyone in, in, in the forestry industry is devastated when, when they hear the news. Do you, the industry, apologise to them for that boy being killed? Um, I'll apologise on behalf of the industry. Um, I apologise on behalf of Te Tairawhiti. Um, you know, it was an accident waiting to happen. She says she feels ignored that her grandson was killed and no one, no one has been in contact with them. I think from, from our perspective, um, 
I think the feeling was that, that they, they wanted their privacy. Uh, we respect people's privacy. Um, if, if she would be willing to meet with someone from the industry, I would be happy to meet and, and just talk through exactly what she would like the industry to do for her or for the family. And what about the log that killed Oliver? Would there be any way of figuring out what company that log came from? The only way that anyone could tell was, first of all, it would have to be uh, the product of production forestry, which we don't know at this stage. Number two, it would have had to have been processed. And number three, it would have had a, a mark to indicate that it came from a, a, um, a woodlot. Um, I don't have that information. Remember, the council scientist does have that information. He's quite sure it is a processed log from a forestry company. And how many companies are on the Waimata River? Uh, in recent years, there's been no less than eight forestry companies harvesting up there. Uh, three of those are members of the Eastland Wood Council. Can we really ever stop logs coming down? I think there can be a reduction. I don't think that you ever eliminate all wood debris that, that makes its way into waterways, but I think that there can be a significant reduction. Back down the coast in Gisborne, I meet the Mayor. It's absolutely heartbreaking. Um, my heart goes out to, to Oliver's whānau. Things do need to change. The council has spent $350,000 of ratepayer money already this year clearing the beaches only for more logs to wash down when it rains. It is absolutely frustrating because we would like to have our beaches the way we love them. And are you worried that it, it's too broke to fix? Those are the type of things that keeps me awake at night, Patty.